Part 4 Ed visited again the night before Halloween. My wife and I sleep on two queen-size beds pushed together. That may seem excessive, but it's a practical solution to many problems that were inhibiting our sleep, such as my snoring and a lack of room caused by a bunch of chihuahuas using us as heating blankets. The biggest reason, though, is her hatred of the fan blowing on us while we slept. With all the extra room, I've started sleeping opposite of the way she does, with my head at the foot of the bed. She gets to sleep comfortably, and I no longer get hit with a pillow in the middle of the night. Last year, we converted a finished room in our basement into our new bedroom, as the two queens wouldn't fit in any of the normal bedrooms. On either side of our mega bed are two large windows. The bottom sills of both are level with our front yard, meaning the first thing I see when I wake up in the mornings is sunshine on the green grass, and the first thing I see when I wake up at night is darkness, most of the time. The night before Halloween, as I was drafting out this next piece after a long weekend of costume preparation, a movement in the window, visible over the top of my laptop, caught my attention. I closed the laptop for a better look, expecting to see a stray cat or a possum, and locked eyes with Ed. I haven't seen that sharp-toothed smile, outside of nightmares at least, in the six years since I moved in with my wife. I almost thought it was a trick of the dark. I've been so wrapped up in telling my story that Ed feels more and more like some sort of fictitious monster instead of a real life... whatever he is. As soon as I saw his face, whatever reserve of relief I had built up emptied away. Ed lay on his stomach with his elbows planted on the ground, his chin resting on the palms of his hands. His long, snake-like fingers seemed to slither up and around the back of his bulbous head. I have no idea how long he was in that position, watching me as I typed up the story about the bathroom. I felt the skin balloon inflate in the back of my throat the longer we stared at each other. Domino, the smallest of our dogs, stirred and barked at the window, startling me out of whatever hypnotic spell Ed's presence had cast. Her sudden bark made me jump, but Ed didn't flinch. I did my best to comfort and hush her before she woke my already stirring wife but two other dogs joined in and rendered my efforts futile. At the window, Ed was on his feet and crouching so that only half of his face was visible as he peered in at my failing attempts to control the pack. He held his stomach while his entire body shook. He was laughing, just like he had that first time I saw him in the daylight. As my wife rolled over with a grunt, Ed waved a goodbye, bending each of his long fingers with slow precision before leaping out of sight. Stop barking, my wife whisper shouted at the dogs. I don't think she realized I was awake until she saw me sitting up and staring out the window. Her voice took on a concerned tone when she asked me what was wrong. I fully intended to answer her, but I had heard a thud amidst the barking, followed by a pattering of lighter thuds moving across the squeaking floor of the room above our own, my daughter's room. I bolted up the stairs and through the kitchen, a small pack of barking chihuahuas in tow. I closed the kitchen door, separating it from the living room, as I passed through it to prevent the dogs from following me. My heart beat hard, as if trying to punch through my chest cavity, as I ran down the hallway toward her room. I was positive that I would find Ed crouched over her head, smiling that wicked smile and running his fingers through her hair, spreading that foul saliva through it like rotting shampoo that would leave her yellow hair full of putrid yellow crust. Instead, when I burst through her cracked door, I saw nothing but the outline of my daughter and her own dog beneath her blanket in the dim light of her room. An accusatory growling from underneath the blanket confirmed how stupid I had been to react with such panic. Her dog was used to the cat coming and going in the night, but had a tendency to bark at strangers even in the daytime. If Ed paid her a visit... It would be barking, I heard, not thumps in the night. As if to confirm this, there was another, louder thump as our Siamese cat, Luke, jumped down from her dresser and ran through my legs, happy to escape whatever madness had brought me upstairs in the first place. My daughter had left her window open before falling asleep, and from outside I heard rough, wheezing laughter from the direction of her driveway.
I closed and locked her window before returning to my room. The only explanation I gave my wife when she asked, again, what was wrong, was a single word. Ed. She's been reading the stories, and she didn't press me for more, though she looked unsettled as soon as I said his name. Still, she didn't have years of memories and bad dreams to fuel her fear, and was able to fall back to sleep without much trouble. All I could do was lay in the dark and stare out the window, sure that I would see his face filling the darkness again at any moment. Slowly, the realization that Ed had been able to get into her room without sending my daughter's dog into a fit of barks. What other explanation could there be for the mangled, yellow-crusted remains of Mr. Bear that had signaled his return in the first place? Once that thought started bouncing around in my head, I knew I wouldn't sleep at all. I didn't go to work on Halloween. Instead, I used the day to write as much as possible before my daughter got home from trick-or-treating. Halloween is about candy and costumes, but I had run out of time to talk to her about Ed, and I promised myself that I would tell her everything the following day. Seeing him again, not just yellow-crusted proof that he was there, but him, was enough to convince me of that. I didn't want her to go through the same hell that I did while figuring out how to stop him. There has to be a way to stop him. The first time I saw Ed in the daylight, the day that my thoughts had been distracted by the after-school conversation I would have with Daniel about what happened to Charlie the Catman, was the day that Ed began to escalate his games. The classrooms at my elementary school opened directly to the outside air. Covered walkways replaced hallways, and the entire school sat on a large, lush property neighboring the humongous high school that I would never attend. I don't know if the open layout is strictly a Southern California thing or not. All of the schools I attended after we moved to Texas were completely indoors with very few windows. But the fresh air and bright, natural light was my favorite thing about the place. There were tunnel-like areas along the hallways where the bathrooms and water fountains were. These tunnels, lacking any overhead lighting, were just long enough to grow dim somewhere in the middle, right where the bathroom doors were. It is in one of these tunnels, as I was making my way to the restroom after finishing our morning math lessons, that I saw Ed. I almost didn't see him at all. That same morning, I had given my first real crush, a blonde girl named Nell, a note at breakfast, asking her to check yes or no if she liked me back. My head was swimming with innocent excitement, and I was busy daydreaming about what amazing things would happen if Nell checked yes. Daydreams and young love could only do so much to block out Ed, however, and twenty feet from the bathroom door, I saw him standing in the next tunnel down the walkway, in frozen place. Even as a child, I knew that an unspoken rule about monsters and nightmares only coming out at night was being forever shattered. If he could come out in the daytime and find me in places beyond the trailer park, then I would always have to look over my shoulder, and I would always be on edge, because there was nowhere to hide from that kind of monster. The next tunnel was a hundred feet or so away. As soon as our eyes locked, he pointed to the scabbed area on his arm where I had stabbed him, then at me, just as he had the night before. He opened his mouth wide, and I prepared myself for the mimic of my own voice to escape his throat again, but the words that came out weren't my own. Help! They're trying to get me! Help! The final words of Charlie the Catman poured from his mouth on repeat, echoing loudly in the tunnel, but were dampened by the fresh air before they could reach me. I could still hear them, but they sounded far away and hollow, like loud music being played by a distant neighbor, where the words can be mostly understood, but the power of the music as a whole has been lost in transit. Ed seemed to realize this, still pointing at me, with the final words of Charlie the Catman still pouring from his open maw, Ed began to run directly at me. I should have turned and run for the nearest classroom. I doubt Ed would have followed me. How scary is a monster that everyone knows about, after all? I might have done that very thing, but I had been on my way to the restroom for a reason, and as soon as Ed started sprinting at me, my bowels let loose and that reason filled my pants. I had survived Ed up to that point, and even as he ran at me and evidence to the contrary ran down my legs, 
I was far more terrified of running into a classroom with crap-filled pants than I was of him. Instead, I ran for the bathroom door. As soon as I entered the door and turned the corner toward the stalls, I slipped on a discarded paper towel and landed hard, my fall cushioned slightly by the mess in my pants. Whatever small chance I may have had of discarding my underwear and keeping my accident a secret disappeared as the force of the impact caused the mess to shoot down my legs and upward out of my pants, destroying my shirt in the process. I heard the door open and scrambled blindly into a stall, almost slipping again on some of the excrement that had smeared on the floor. As I locked the stall door and slowly backed away from it, I heard slow footsteps from the other side and nothing else. Not even his raspy wheeze. Whatever game he was playing with me had only just begun. I saw a shape move in front of the crack where the stall door closed and readied myself for Ed. Instead, I heard, Ew, you pooped your pants! I'm telling Mrs. West! Mrs. West, my teacher, had grown concerned for how long I had been gone and had sent a classmate to check on me. The small bathroom filled with his high laughter and the sing-song repetition of what would become my new nickname, Bobby Poopy Pants, echoed off the walls until the bathroom door swung closed behind him and the song faded, first into soft echoes and then silence. All of my fear turned into a deep, gut-wrenching embarrassment. I jerked my pants down and immediately began ripping toilet paper off of the roll to clean myself, but all I managed to do was spread the mess around. Then I began stuffing toilet paper inside of my pants, irrationally thinking that if I used enough of it, I would be able to make it through the rest of the day without a problem. That's when I heard his dry, wheezing laughter from above me. The last bit of fluid that was left in my bladder escaped with a sad trickle as I let out a small, pathetic whimper. I looked up. Ed was perched on the top of the stall, pointing down at me with one long finger, his body shaking with laughter. Stop it! I screamed at him. Instead, he opened his mouth wide, and the sing-song voice of the kid who had found me played out from it like a skipping record. Bobby poopy pants! Bobby poopy pants! I sat on the toilet, put my face in my hands, and cried while he laughed and sang that cruel song above me. A short time later, I heard the restroom door open again, and the singing stopped abruptly. I looked up at where Ed had been and saw one of his legs as he disappeared through one of the bathroom's high windows. What followed was a very awkward and painful conversation between a teacher's aide and a young boy who looked like he had stepped on a landmine in a sewer. She retrieved some gym towels and a set of ill-fitting lost-and-found clothing for me to change into. After helping me to clean up, trying her best to be sympathetic, and probably not to laugh, she led me to the nurse's office, where I waited for over an hour until my mom could finally pick me up. Even though the teacher's aide and the boy that Mrs. West had sent had been the only two people who had actually seen me looking like a smaller version of the shit demon from Dogma, the outcome was just as painful as if she had instead paraded me in front of large classroom windows singing Bobby Poopy Pants. The story spread, the nickname stuck, and I was treated like a leper by the kids in my class for most of my remaining time at that school. I didn't go back to school until the following week. My first day back, one of Nell's friends returned the note I had given her with a small, evil snicker. I'll let you guess which box she checked. At least there was Daniel. When I finally saw him two days after the incident, he laughed, but not at me so much as the story itself. He told his own story about a game of dodgeball where some kid pulled his pants and underwear down, allowing a second child to throw one of the red rubber dodgeballs directly at Daniel's exposed crotch, causing his own balls to turn a similar shade of red. I appreciated the empathy, but I wasn't built from the same stuff as Daniel. I wasn't the kind of kid who would be able to laugh something that embarrassing off and move on, and I envied Daniel's ability to do so. Every laugh in my direction and every hushed whisper behind my back just had to be about me. I had a problem gaining and keeping friends at that school because I was completely unable to grasp the fact that I was the one making my situation as bad as it was. I eventually started acting up and doing poorly on purpose in the hopes that I would be sent back to my old school, 
where nobody knew who Bobby Poopy Pants was. It was all for naught. It only hurt my education and further lowered my self-esteem. That one incident defined me in my own mind, and it ruined school for me. The fact that kids are infernal a-holes who will latch onto and exploit the weakness of other children for the sheer fun of it didn't help matters. I stayed the night at Daniel's that Saturday, and he did his best to take my mind off my crippling embarrassment with video games and pogs. I had stopped thinking about Charlie the Catman, but Daniel hadn't. After hours of playing had lightened me up some, he finally told me what I had once been so eager to know. When they were moving Charlie into the ambulance that day, I'm pretty sure I heard one of the ambulance guys whispering about weird bite marks and his face being eaten off. Seriously? Yeah. They put tape on the door and everything, like in those cop shows. But nobody has been back there yet. They just drive by sometimes, but nobody goes in. What would eat a person's face? I already knew one answer to that question, but I asked it anyway, trying to sound as excited as Daniel was, despite the sudden memory of Ed roosting in Charlie's window, trying to wriggle to the front of my thoughts. My mom said it was his cats, but I don't think so. I peeked in on the way home yesterday, and there's still cat food in the bowls, even though the cops moved them out of the way. Why would they eat him if they had other food? That makes sense, I guess. I want to go to his house later and see if we can figure out what happened. My mom gets mad when I ask about it now, but it reminds me of one of those Hardy Boys books you let me borrow. You want to solve the mystery with me? How will we get in? I thought about it and then added with some dismay. They probably locked it, you know. It's just a sliding door. I can jimmy it with a screwdriver. My dad showed me how once. It's easy. Daniel's dad was a convicted felon, an all-around bad dude, so the fact that we would be using skills Daniel had learned from him to solve this mystery should have been a red flag. Still, I said yes. Daniel was my best friend, and he had always been there for me. It was only fair that I return the favor, even if what he was suggesting would mean big trouble if we were caught. I'll admit that it was more than just loyalty. I couldn't help but wonder if I would find yellow crust near the spot where they found Charlie, confirming my own suspicions about what would eat a person's face. It wasn't hard to sneak over to Charlie's trailer, as it was only a few trailers away, as I have mentioned before. We told his mom we were going to play outside, maybe even look at some stars in Daniel's telescope, and she told us to stay off the street. We didn't technically lie, though that didn't matter later on. Daniel had insisted on bringing tools to help with our sleuthing. He had a multitude of screwdrivers tucked into his pockets, and he had given me a hammer in case we needed to pry up floorboards or something. I should point out that trailers don't have floorboards, but the Hardy Boys, we were not. I'd like to say that we found something amazing, or at least informative, in Charlie's house that night, but we didn't even get the door unlocked. Daniel tried to open the door with various screwdrivers for a long time, stopping only to hide when the headlights of a turning car washed up the street, but he couldn't get it to budge. Eventually, one set of headlights that drove us into hiding seemed to be moving more slowly than the others had. As the car approached Charlie's trailer, red and blue lights joined the bright white of their headlights, followed by a loud whoop noise. I don't know if someone called the cops on us, or if they were just doing a patrol of the crime scene. All I know is that neither of us wanted to get in trouble. We jumped from our hiding places and ran. Daniel ran the opposite direction of his own trailer, while I ran across the street into a small patch of trees. The cops shouted for us to stop, but at that point we were committed to the escape. In retrospect, I'm lucky I didn't get shot or tased. We were kids, sure, but we hadn't exactly announced our age before running away. Once I thought I was reasonably hidden up a tree, I felt the weight of the hammer in my hand and thought it would be best to get rid of it. I turned around and threw it further back into the trees. A second later, the hammer flew back at me from the darkness and hit me full in the eye. The instant and tremendous pain turned my vision red. I screamed a word I wasn't supposed to know, much less say, as I fell from my hiding place, landing nearly at the feet of one of the cops. I thought he would be angry, but instead, he calmly asked who I was and what I was doing out so late, cussing and trespassing on crime scenes. 
Through fits and sobs, I explained that I had been trying to solve a mystery, and that I had thrown the hammer I was going to use to find clues away so they didn't think it was a weapon, but that it came back and hit me in the face. He looked like he was fighting a smile throughout my confession, and when I was done, he gently moved my hands from my face to take a look at my eye. You're lucky the claw end didn't catch you, or you'd have turned into a mystery-solving pirate. You'll be fine. He nodded and let me put my hands back. Probably bounced right off a tree and ricocheted back at you. I suppose that shiner will be punishment enough. Got the other one, his partner said as he approached, gripping Daniel by the arm. As the cop who had checked my eye out left me again to regain my bearings while he helped interrogate Daniel, I heard a soft chuckle coming from the woods. I looked toward the sound and, once I wiped the tears from my good eye, saw Ed standing near a tree, smiling wide and waving the hammer back and forth. I started to speak, to try and get the cop's attention and explain that it hadn't been a ricochet but a monster, and that it was the same monster that killed Charlie, and that he was standing right there. I never got the chance. Ed stopped laughing and made that angry hissing sound, pointing the hammer at me with a threatening glare. Seconds later, a loud shriek of, Daniel! What did you do? echoed down the street. Despite Daniel doing his best to give the cops false answers and keep our parents from finding out what we had tried to do, the lights of the cop car had begun to draw out the curious like flies. His mom wasn't the first, but she was the closest, and even at a distance and despite the whirling blue and red police lights, she recognized her son as the one being questioned. Ed laughed once more, surely at the defeat he saw in my good eye, before dropping the hammer, putting a finger to his lips, and fading back into the darkness of the trees. Within half an hour, I was in my own bed at home, grounded for a week, and listening to my mom seethe to my father over the phone about what a bad influence Daniel was turning out to be. That was the first strike against my friendship with Daniel. Since my mom had lost her trust in Daniel, my grandmother had been the one to take over bus stop duty, and she made sure I knew how much of an inconvenience it was for her to miss the best part of her stories because I had been a bad boy. On top of that, Ed had begun visiting me more often. He seemed to care less about secrecy, favoring waking me up suddenly with loud noises or movements and laughing at the scared, disoriented look on my face each and every time. That wasn't the only thing different about his visits. The first time he visited after the incident with the police, he sat at the end of my bed and pointed at different toys. I stared at him, perplexed. He grew more frustrated with each silent moment of confusion. Finally, he reached near my head and grabbed my old Teddy Ruxpin doll, grunted, and turned to leave. No, not that one, I said in a frantic whisper. Teddy had been one of my favorites, and the desperation in my voice seemed to inform him of this. He looked back at me, made a snorting noise that sounded almost arrogant, and set the toy back in its place near my head. He then sat down, pointed to another one near my head, and waited. I finally understood. Before that night, I always found random toys destroyed after the fact, and most of them were random fodder toys I kept at the foot of my bed for just that purpose. That's the night he started making me choose which one he would destroy, and I had unintentionally informed him which of them were the most important to me. Even though I understood what he wanted, I didn't play along the first time. I kept shaking my head no, unwilling to give him permission to take any of them. With each shake of my head, his smile broadened a little further until the upper half of his large head seemed to be held in place by an oozing garden of razor-sharp teeth. After he had pointed at every toy on my bed, he grabbed three of my favorites, action figures from my favorite movie, Hook, and jumped through the window before I could offer any sort of objection. The next day I found them on the ground outside of my window, headless and smashed to pieces presumably with the all-too-familiar hammer lying next to the mess of broken plastic. From that point on, even though it killed a piece of my childhood each and every time, I always chose. Life was miserable, but it made me double my efforts to earn back the privilege of hanging out with my best friend. It took a few weeks of persistent, 
if illogical, reasoning to convince my mom that it had been a misunderstanding and to give Daniel another chance. All the while, I would do every chore possible in an attempt to further wear down her walls of anger. Finally, she relented, and things went back to normal for a short time. Then those two boys were murdered on the river near the salt flats, and nothing was ever the same again. It was a vacation period, which meant that every ounce of daylight lost to chores or boredom was a small piece of childhood lost. On that particular day, we had mapped a course through the streets of the trailer park. This course was to be the bike race to end all bike races, and most of the day was spent planning out and preparing the obstacles and challenges along the course. There were certain spots where we would have to complete some sort of activity before continuing on. Some of the other neighborhood kids, in on the fun, were stationed along the route with water balloons, ready to throw them as we passed. We didn't even break to eat lunch. Finally, after hours of preparation, we were ready. The race would begin and end in front of my trailer, and I walked my bike over from the spot near the porch where I kept it chained with unearned swagger. As I rounded the first turn, my bike chain came loose and got caught up in one of my shoes. Daniel rode away, laughing loudly over his shoulder, leaving me struggling to stay on my feet and cursing under my breath. It didn't take much time to reattach the chain once I got it untangled, but there was a faint cat food smell mixed in with the oil, and I was sure that it hadn't come off by accident. By the time I had finished reattaching the chain, Daniel was no longer visible, and I knew I would have to pedal my butt off to catch up. Stupidly, I kept shifting my focus between the road ahead of me and my bike chain as I sped along the course, searching for any signs that it would pop off again. In my inattention, I didn't notice that a truck had started pulling forward from a stop sign a short distance ahead of me. Had the truck not been pulling a flatbed trailer full of camping equipment and rope, there was so much rope, I would have missed hitting it completely. Instead, by the time I looked up, it was too late to slow down, and I slammed into the joint connecting the truck hitch to the flatbed. The sudden stop flipped me forward over the handlebars, and I landed hard on my back. The driver didn't seem to notice, and the truck continued to move forward. I was sure that the wheel of the flatbed was going to run over my head, and I doubted my bike helmet would offer much protection. The wheel stopped a foot from my face, and a moment later I heard the truck door open as the driver stepped out. He was a muscular man with a neck thicker than his actual head. His eyebrows were set in a permanent, impatient scowl over his small, irritated-looking face. I was sure he was going to start yelling at me. Instead, he looked around and, seeing there was nobody else around to help me, sighed and approached. "'Are you hurt?' His voice was low and gruff. "'I don't think so. "'Why don't you let me take you to the hospital, just to be sure?' He bent down and reached out, as if to grab me. I scooted out of his reach. I live close by, sir. My mom can take a look at me. I quickly got to my feet, ignoring the aches all over my body. He pointed at the dented front wheel of my bike. Maybe I can fix that for you instead, as an apology. He took a step closer and motioned to the flatbed. I might have a spare wheel or two in there somewhere. As he took another step towards me, he smiled. It looked wrong on his face, and it's the only smile I have ever seen that has scared me more than Ed's. I have a tent and some fun stuff you can play with while you wait. He took another step closer, glancing from side to side again, and reached for me once more. I backed away. No, really, I'm fine. I'm in the middle of a race, so I have to go. Bye! His face grew red and the smile turned to a clenching grimace as he took a large, sudden step forward and wrapped his hand around my upper arm. You think you can hit my truck and walk away, you little brat? No, that won't do. He started to drag me toward the open door of his truck. You need to be punished. His head was a well-oiled swivel as it whipped back and forth on his bulging neck, surely looking for someone who could help him find my parents so that the punishment he promised could be delivered. There was a scream from behind me. I turned around and saw Daniel speeding up the road on his bike, ignoring the other kids chasing after him who were laughing and throwing water balloons. The man looked between Daniel and the front door of his truck for a moment, 
probably deciding if he could get me inside for a time out before another kid showed up to cause more trouble. As soon as I saw that look of contemplation on his face, I began to struggle. In his grip, my struggling was useless, but eventually his gaze settled on my bike and he released me, probably deciding that having to explain my broken bike was punishment enough for running into his truck. As I was trying to pull away when he let me go, I fell backward hard and scraped my palms on the ground when I tried to catch myself. I heard the slam of the truck door and the sound of squealing tires, followed by a crunch as he sped away. Daniel skidded to a stop in front of me and reached out to help me up. I was spooked, and my palms hurt, but otherwise I was fine. The angry look on his face turned to one of dismay, and I followed his gaze to find the mangled remains of my bike. The man in the truck had run over it in his hurry to get away, and no amount of tinkering was going to bring it back to life. Thanks, I muttered. I probably would have been grounded for the rest of the summer if that guy had talked to my mom. And I lost the race. I kicked at the wrecked remains of my bike and then had a realization. Wait, why didn't you finish the race? You didn't try to help when my chain broke. Are you joking? A confused and troubled expression spread over his face. I came back here because I heard you screaming for help, you big baby. I was not. Yes, you were. His worry was quickly turning to anger. You were screaming, help me, before they take me away. I knew that I hadn't screamed for help, but I argued no further. I had a broken bike to drag home to a mother who was sure to be angry, and I didn't want to be on bad terms with my best friend before I was surely grounded. I wasn't grounded, though. My mom was already upset about something when Daniel and I dragged the wreckage back across the finish line of the unfinished race and explained what had happened. The explanation only angered her more, and even though I was the one who had run into the truck and Daniel had done nothing but come speeding over when he heard me calling for help, she put all the fault on him and sent him home with a vicious scowl. That was strike two. After she spent a long time worriedly checking me over for injuries, ignoring my assurances that it was my bike that needed fixing and not me, her worry again turned to fury. She called Daniel's mom and spent at least ten minutes screaming about how Daniel was older and it was his responsibility to keep me safe when we were together, not teach me to be a criminal like him. Daniel's mom was screaming back, but I couldn't hear the words. My mom kept cutting off her screams with exaggerations and threats and questions and something about how I could have ended up like those boys in the salt field. Eventually, she slammed the phone into the receiver, flipped a middle finger at it, and stormed outside to smoke a cigarette. I tried again to explain to her that it had been my fault, that I hadn't been paying attention, but she wasn't listening to me at all. She was looking out at the large, dry area behind the trailer park that led to the salt fields and the Ote River, with tears streaming down her face. When she was done with her cigarette, she sent me to my room to watch television while she called my aunt. I woke up that night to the sounds of loud screams and cries for help. I had to remind myself that it couldn't be Charlie because he was dead. Also, the screams were more frantic and high-pitched than those of the Catman. The screams grew softer, and I sat up to look out my window, hoping to see the source, when Ed suddenly leapt to my window sill and crouched there, his mouth opened wide. The screaming sounds were coming from his mouth, but I ignored them in favor of venting my own frustrations on him. You almost got me killed today messing with my bike chain like that. He pointed at his open mouth. The sounds of screaming changed into sounds of whimpering and crying. I don't care. I don't have a bike or a best friend anymore, and it's your fault. Are you happy? I had seen a lot of emotions cross Ed's ugly expression over the years, but that night I saw a new one. As I stared into his eyes, waiting for some semblance of an answer and knowing it would never come, I saw that he didn't look happy. He looked, well, sad. He pointed his fingers at his mouth again, as if the answers I was looking for were waiting inside. The sound changed one last time, and this time there were four words amidst the sounds of crying. Please don't kill me. Go away, I said. Ed pointed at his mouth fervently, reaching for my arm with his other hand. 
It reminded me too much of the man in the truck grabbing for me, and I defensively shoved Ed backwards. His mouth snapped shut, and the sound coming from his mouth ceased. The sadness in his eyes had been replaced with an even stranger emotion. Hurt. Eventually, he leapt back through the window, without even a hiss or a grunt, and was gone. Something in my mother broke the day of the bike race, and it has never completely healed over. She was always protective, and she always worried about us getting hurt. But after that day, it became overbearing. She became somewhat of a paranoid hypochondriac about even the smallest of things, and the days of playing outside close to sunset or without supervision disappeared until well after we moved to Texas. My mom woke us the morning after the bike race and informed us that we would be staying at my aunt's for the rest of the school break. I could see that she was still angry about the previous day, and so I didn't question her, though I was upset that I wasn't going to see Daniel for nearly two weeks because of a stupid misunderstanding. As I closed my bedroom window, I saw something strange pinned to the ground beneath the corpse of my bike, a pile of empty wrappers and a ketchup-stained bag from Rally's, a burger drive through across the street from the trailer park. We hadn't been there in a while, and I passed it off as wind-blown trash getting stuck sometime in the night. That didn't explain why the bag was underneath the wreckage, but I was used to seeing strange things, and this was a particularly boring strange thing. As the news about the boys in the salt fields unfolded over the next few weeks, thoughts of that rally's trash would be anything but boring. I spent the next two weeks listening in on conversations, looking for a way to ease my mother's anger at Daniel, but I was a terrible spy. Boredom got the better of me, and I spent the rest of our time there trying to find something fun to do that didn't require a bike. With the exception of the news reports, it wasn't a terrible vacation. For those two weeks, I didn't see Ed at all. I know very few details about the boys that were found at the salt fields other than what I had seen on the news as a kid. Plenty of people were afraid after the bodies were found because the killer hadn't been. When we moved to Texas, years after the day of the bike race, the case was still unsolved. We didn't have Google or news alerts back then, so we didn't keep up with the story once we moved away, but I was sure the cops would never know who killed those boys. But I knew. He's the reason I'm sharing my story, and the reason I'm going to talk to my daughter as soon as I finish writing this. He's the one who nearly got me killed by sabotaging my bike. The one who taunted me the night of the bike race by mimicking what I'm sure were the screams of those boys being murdered in the salt fields. The one who had stuck trash from rallies under my bike as a warning. Trash covered in red stains that looked so much like ketchup. Ed the Head Eater killed those boys. I'm sure of it. And now he's back. Author's Note I called my mother before I wrote the part below. I called my mom a little while ago looking for some insight into her reactions the day of the bike race, as well as to clarify some of my memories about the unsolved murders of the boys in the salt fields. What I thought would be a ten-minute conversation lasted nearly an hour, and it is the first time my mom has ever sounded happy when I told her I had to go. I learned two important things during the phone call. First, thanks to advances in forensics, they had identified the man who killed those boys twelve years after their deaths. Second, his name, Scott Thomas Erskine. For most of my life, my memories and opinions of Ed have been stained by my absolute certainty that he killed those two boys. That certainty has always been the fuel behind my desire to learn more about Ed, because he needed to be stopped. I consider myself fairly rational and fact-driven, but even after the phone call, I immediately assumed that Ed had simply framed a man for his own monstrous crimes, and that he had finally returned because he knew how close I was to finding that out, and wanted a front-row seat to my unraveling. I wanted to finish this with the details of those two murdered boys, but I have done less than one minute of research based on the information my mom gave me. Anything I write now would be based on those stained memories instead of the truth. I need to re-examine everything before I tell that part of the story, because the only truth I know now is how wrong I have been about everything. The truth was waiting for me at the top of the first search result link, and I recalled the day of the bike race not through the eyes of the frightened child I had been, but those of the analytical adult I had become. I assumed he had been looking around for someone else to help me, 
or to find someone who knew my parents so that he could tell them how their kid hadn't been paying attention when he crashed into his truck. The truth is that he was making sure there weren't any witnesses. I had assumed he had tried to pull me into the cab of his truck to ensure that I couldn't escape before he was able to return me to my parents and ensure that I was punished. The truth is that he wanted to punish me, and my punishment would have been never seeing my parents again. I had assumed that the equipment in the flatbed trailer had been for camping. The truth is, God, all of that rope. There had been so much rope. I didn't have to try to remember the face of the man in the truck, because the same furrowed brows and cold, dead eyes, the centerpiece of a too small head balanced atop a thick, muscular neck, stared back at me from my computer screen. The truth was confirmed by three words centered over the death row mugshot of the man in the truck. Those three words were his name, Scott Thomas Erskine.